Hi guys, in this video I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the chemistry behind uh, sulfonamides and how sulfonamides work as um, treatment to cure bacterial infections such as urinary tract infections. So sulfonamides, um, they work by preventing bacteria from forming this compound here, this, this THF, tetrahydrofolate. So I'm going to call this THF. So by preventing bacteria forming THF, that prevents nucleic acid synthesis, such as DNA and RNA. And without the synthesis of these, then again, the bacteria will cease to grow. They won't kill the bacteria. These are called bacteria static um, antimicrobials, uh, again, prevents the bacteria from growing. Okay. So it does so by preventing the formation of this THF. Now, interestingly enough, humans and, and animals, they also need THF. We also need nucleic acids. Now, the difference between humans and bacteria is that this DHF, this dihydrofolate here, humans get this from the diet. So humans get this from their diet. The key thing is bacteria cannot absorb this. Bacteria cannot absorb DHF. So bacteria need another way to get THF. Because remember, to get THF, they need DHF. So what bacteria do is they start with simpler chemicals. And they start with this chemical here. And this reacts with something called para-aminobenzoic acid to produce a compound called dihydroteroate that then reacts with glutamic acid to produce DHF. So the key thing is that this step here and this step here does not occur in humans. It's only this step involving dihydrofolate reductase, DHF to THF, which um, is involved in humans. Okay, so we could put down sort of as a little note. Um, so this is in bacteria only. So that's the key thing about this dihydroteroate synthesis. That is in bacteria only. We do not have that enzyme because we absorb DHF from the diet. And the dihydroteroate synthetase is there in effect so the bacteria can make this DHF. So very, very quickly, it's not massively important um, for sort of um, pharmacy, pharmaceutical sciences and so on. This is more sort of an in-depth chemistry. But what's really going on here is that this um, OPP is basically a um, two phosphate groups. That is in effect lost and swaps places um, with this group here. In effect, what happens is that one of the hydrogens of paramino benzoic acid tags on with this group here. So in effect, they combine, oops, they combine. And you get this, in effect, this okay, so that this group here will gain a hydrogen from paramino benzoic acid. And then this nitrogen, which I'll kind of highlight in blue this nitrogen here will then bond with that carbon there and you can see that new bond is um, in effect here that's the new bond which has been formed okay the dihydroteroate then reacts with the glutamic acid in a simple condensation so in effect you've got your carboxylic acid group there and you've got your 
amine group there. And in effect, what goes on there is, in effect, what you should have seen many times in the condensation reaction, that the water is lost. Again, we'll sort of highlight the OH from there, the H from there, and that will then combine to produce this amide functional group, um, which is what we've got, and I'll highlight that in sort of in, in blue, is what we've got there. Okay. So in effect, that's what's going on when the dihydroteriate reacts with the glutamic acid. So, because we do not have this enzyme, this dihydroteroate synthetase, it provides us a way to selectively target the bacteria. And the sulfonamides are basically competitive inhibitors. So, sulfonamides, what are they? They are reversible, competitive Inhibitors. Okay, that means that they will form um, generally non covalent interactions with the enzyme active site. Um, Paramino benzoic acid forms these, um, obviously, has these non covalent interactions. So, phonomides being reversible competitive inhibitor will have similar non-covalent interactions as well. So if we just have a brief look at the structure of para-aminobenzoic acid. So we've got this carboxylic acid group, benzene ring, and this amine. What usually will happen is that this will, this will form a, an ionic interaction and therefore we can see that we would have an ionic interaction with the target, the enzyme, a van der Waals, hydrophobic interactions, and potential hydrogen bonding here. So it's important, again, when you're looking at um, the structure of a drug, think about like, what binding interactions could take place. So we see we've got an ionic interaction, van der Waals or hydrophobic interactions, and we've got um, hydrogen bonding. So my sulfonamide should form similar binding interactions. It's competing with the active site. So if it's competing with the active site, you'd imagine it's going to have a similar structure and similar binding interactions. So the sulfonamide has, again, very similar structure to the, again, I'm just going to copy this, has a similar structure to that of the substrate for the active site, the paraamino benzoic acid. The difference being is, in effect, what's on here. So this is, in effect, the same, but here now we've got a sulfonamide rather than a carboxylic acid functional group, which is I'm just going to call this an R group. Now we might be thinking, how am I going to get my ionic interaction here? Well, the reason being is that this hydrogen here is, is generally acidic and when this is lost, and we'll just show it being lost, we would get a negative charge on this nitrogen. And there is this, this negative charge can be stabilised by resonance. And we can show that by the movement of these uh, electrons. So that means that the negative charge is actually delocalised actually over this whole group here. And obviously... When charges spread, it makes things a little bit more stable. So if I just, again, I'm just going to copy this. 
That would give me then a what we call a canonical form or resonance structure, which we represent by a double headed arrow. And again, the result of the curly arrows is now that curly arrow there, oops, only a small eraser. That now we've got rid of the negative charge. And now here, the result of this curly arrow here is that we've now got a double bond. And the result of this curly arrow here is then to break this bond. And that gives us a negative charge on here. And that now gives us our ionic interaction. So we can see now, hopefully by looking at these two structures here and here, the sulfonamide and the paraminobenzoic acid, the normal substrate for dihydroteroate synthetase, are very, very similar. Form similar binding interactions and again, therefore, can act as a competitive inhibitor. Now, sulfonamides, one of the sort of originated from prontosil. Prontosil was, uh, is a compound which is actually a prodrug. So this is not the actual active form. What happens is you get a reduction. So this double bond breaks. And in effect, you add, in effect, four hydrogens. So two hydrogens basically add here. Two hydrogens add here. And that gives us our sulfonilamide, which is one of the first sulfonamide um, antimicrobials. So that's how we kind of the first sulfonamides were were uh, discovered. So this is my general structure of a sulfonamide. And obviously we need um, hydrogen bonding interactions on this nitrogen here. We need this van der Waals interaction. We need this ionic interaction. So what can we actually vary? Very little. Is, is the answer, we can vary very little, that the key thing that I can vary, in effect, is this R group here. That's the main thing. Now, we have put an R group on there because, in, in reality, we actually need structure activity relations have shown that this here should be a primary amine. So we might be thinking, well, what can we do? What is the R group going to be? Well, to increase absorption, making the molecule more hydrophobic, we can convert this primary amine into um, a secondary amide. And we can do that by adding an acyl group. So if I just copy this. So can see here we've got my sulfonamide. And I'm going to convert this R group into a... This is now going to be an acyl group. Let's call it, for example, CH3. This would make the compound more hydrophobic, increase absorption. What could happen then, or what will happen then, is this will then be uh, undergo a hydrolysis reaction. So this could be hydrolyzed. And that would then potentially produce my, again, so if this is hydrolyzed, this R group then will turn into a hydrogen, which is, again, what we actually need for this compound to work. So this then would be, again, a example of a prodrug. And it's very, very common. These prodrugs are a bit more hydrophobic and then usually by hydrolysis of an amide, hydrolysis of an ester, that then unmasks the, the group which is required for activity. So we can also vary the R group. Um, and again, varying the R group will affect the pKa of this uh, acidic hydrogen here. So if I just, I'm just going to cut and paste this compound here. So if I just have a look at this compound here, 
get rid of the arrows. So we can see here we've got this negative charge, okay? On, it's on the end. In, in reality, we should be aware that that negative charge is actually delocalized across the whole of this group. But this is going to be more stable if this negative charge can be kind of diluted somehow. And if this R group is, for example, an electron withdrawing group, okay, that will withdraw electron density and that will stabilise the negative charge. So in effect, that will lower the pKa of that acidic hydrogen. Okay, now that can be advantageous because when these drugs are metabolized, they are metabolized to a more hydrophobic compound. So when they're metabolized, for example, so if I want to metabolize this, sometimes it can be metabolized in such a way where this is converted to an, an acyl group. And this is more hydrophobic and actually can lead to toxic effects. If this R group is an electron withdrawing group, that will mean that this is more likely to be ionized. This group here is more likely to be ionized. Okay, and if that group's more likely to be ionized, it will increase water solubility and that potentially could limit the toxic side effects. So that's the very basics of sulfonamides and uh, how sulfonamides work as um, antimicrobials.